Tonight's presentation is the Aero V engine and the Aero injector, power for the sport pilot. And our presenter tonight is none other than John Monette, who is the designer of all of the Sonics aircraft. Uh, but he goes back further than just the Sonics aircraft. For those of you that don't know, he was his his main first design was the Sonarai. Uh, but he's had a number of them. I have only listed a few of them: the Moni Motor Glider. And then obviously you get into his current designs, the Sonics, the YX, and the Xenos, which are the ones that they're currently offering through Sonics Aircraft. Uh, for those of you that didn't place it, he was on the cover of the February edition that we're showing right here. That is John flying uh, one of his aircraft. He is an airplane, uh, A&P mechanic, an airframe and power plant mechanic. And he was inducted into the EA Home Bowlers Hall of Fame in 2001. He's a very innovative person always coming up with new ideas, uh, new ways to do it better, cheaper, and easier, as I can attest. I've had the opportunity to work with John quite a bit over the uh, 11 years that I've lived in Oshkosh, and I count him as a, f a friend of mine. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John. Uh, John, are you, uh, uh, hold on one second, are you with us tonight? I'm going to unmute your mic, and you should be live now. Hi, Charlie. Hey, John. Hey, John. And hello, everybody out there, and thank you for having me. Well, it's it's our pleasure, John. Good, good, cool. So uh, I'm going to uh, put our screen up, and uh, are you seeing that okay? Everything looks great on my end. Yeah, everybody should know a disclosure that I'm uh, talking to you from uh, sunny Florida. It's just raining right now, but uh, other than that, uh, we're down here on vacation but uh, are taking time to... Uh, to talk to everybody on, on uh, our Aero-V engines and a little bit about the history and about what we think and our philosophy about uh, engines for home builds. So, would you like me to start? It's all yours, John. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, I can preface this by saying that uh, Charlie and I have a lot of banter between each other, and so if it's, it changes a little bit during the presentation, don't be surprised. Um, this is a basic Aero V2.1 uh, engine, and uh, we're going to go a little bit into just a short history about our experience with uh, VW-based engines and why we're so uh, adamant about their use and uh, our proponents of, of uh, this kind of engine. Um, back in 1970, actually, uh, my first home built, uh, this is a, by the way, this is a view in the background of the first tent at Oshkosh in 1970, so uh, you can see the kinds of home builds that were there, and this is a little airplane I called a Mini. Uh, it was based on a Genie's Tina, which was highly modified, but the, the engine itself was a VW that I picked up out of, a, literally out of a junkyard, put a number of parts on it that were produced by a gentleman named Huggins back then was kind of a guru of early VW production and uh, we flew this airplane uh, just a, a few weeks before Oshkosh and I had the pleasure of, of flying it with uh, famous people like Ray Heggie. Uh, it was uh, really an enjoyment. Uh, in 1970, uh, of course, we saw Steve Whitman's partly built uh, Formula V racer uh, called the V-Wit and uh, it inspired me to go home and, uh, you know, scratch on, the, on literally on the kitchen table uh, a new design that would meet the Formula V racing category, and that became the Sonray 1. This picture is uh, from the Sport Aviation in 1971, but uh, we showed up uh, after building this airplane in nine months with uh, a VW-based engine, and, and uh, proud to say that that both Steve Whitman and I uh, in 1971 came up with VW-powered uh, airplanes that instead of going, well, the fastest VW-powered airplane in 1970 uh, could do about 128 miles an hour, and that was with a retracting gear and a full-pressure cowl and everything. Uh, and with 1,600cc engines, uh, Steve and I were able to up that speed to nearly 170 miles an hour. So uh, we saw a quantum leap in uh, the the idea of putting a VW uh, engine in an airplane and having some real performance. Uh, the Sonray really became the test bed uh, for a whole bunch of ideas. Uh, this airplane, and in this picture you can see the aluminum landing gear. This is the first airplane to fly with a uh, spring aluminum landing gear. Now, of course, Steve Whitman was famous for his 
uh, steel uh, string gear and the tubular gear that the airplane that we see, the kind of gear that we see on all the RVs and Cessnas today. And I'm proud to say that uh, you know, actually Steve's last airplane had an aluminum spring gear that we made for it. But this airplane uh, tested a number of different engines, uh, tail configurations, and prop configurations. It flew with about 100 different propellers during its career. John, I believe uh, we have that uh, aircraft in the museum here at uh, Oshkosh, do we not? Yeah, it is in display. It's uh, usually uh, during the fly-in, it's on display in the the little uh, museum annex that's just right out on the field right near the home builders uh, headquarters. Um, that airplane actually led to uh, the development of, uh, and, and we're talking now about engines that were only uh, 1600 cc's, the stock VW engine out of a, a, a current VW at the time. Uh, that was the largest uh, engine built uh, in what we call the type 1 or type 3 engine uh, in the normal VW bug or micro, micro bus. Uh, we thought that we would like to have a trainer uh, for uh, for Formula V racing, and with a little creative uh, changing of the airplane, we, we uh, actually took the Sonaray One as a basis. The rear cockpit of the Sonaray Two is actually the co the same position to the wing as the normal cockpit in the Sonaray One. Uh, by extending the firewall and uh, in in mounting the engine to the firewall, we were able to get enough room in the front for a cockpit, a small cockpit, obviously, uh, because this is a very tiny airplane running on only 1,700 cc engine. But uh, it achieved a cruise speed of about 140 miles an hour and still very popular home built uh, in those days. It went through a number of uh, configuration changes uh, with uh, this addition of a low wing airplane. And uh, both together, uh, they were, you know, they were light, high performance airplanes. I'll give you an idea. They weighed about 500 pounds empty with uh, 16, uh, 1,700 cc engines, and uh, you know they were bent, meant like all sport planes, uh, even today. Uh, you know they're they're flown solo most of the time, but they did have room for uh, another passenger, albeit small. Uh, and as we increased the abil ability, what happened uh, in the early 70s uh, and, and actually through the later 70s, you know, we saw all this interest in uh, dune buggies and midget racing, etc. So uh, there were a lot of aftermarket parts coming that built uh, bigger engines out of the 1600 cc VW. Uh, we could put bigger cylinders on. There were new cams. There were stroker cranks or modified cranks, so that we eventually got. Uh, the displacement up to over two liters. This happens to be an airplane that's powered by a 2180. Uh, the basic core of this engine is what we use today, uh, so it's well proven. Uh, but because of what our philosophy about power loading as much as wing loading with airplanes, uh, since we had more power, we were able to stretch the front cockpit of this airplane and uh, provide a little more payload. Uh, and made it a, a little more versatile for uh, bigger guys. Not the bubbas that we have today, but bigger guys. Um, in really uh, uh, it, it period of uh, the middle 70s, Pete Buck, uh, my design partner, came to work for me as a kid. He was building the Sonaray II and uh, started working in the shop, and we had uh, worked on several uh, airplanes, uh, particularly the Monterey sailplane. And with some of its components one day, of course, we just uh, sitting around talking about, I don't know, maybe there was some alcohol involved, I don't know, but we started talking about um, uh, building a hot rod, uh, an airplane that wasn't constricted by the formula, Formula V racing, uh, just an airplane with a big engine in it and uh, using some of the techniques that we, we found on the Monterey sailplane, like the bonded wing structure, et cetera, et cetera. And we came up with this airplane called the Monix. And Charlie, this one also is in the EA Museum collection and is on display with the Sonaray One. Uh, this airplane only weighed 410 pounds. It had a 2180 VW engine that we upped the compression ratio to 11 to 1. It didn't have an oil cooler, um, but it had a good pressure cowling, and uh, it was a real interesting airplane to fly. Uh, you could see both sides of the county, and when you were landing, that's about it. Um, but uh, once it was off the ground, it was a delight to fly, but uh, landing and takeoffs were really a challenge. Uh, in 1982, uh, my buddy Chuck Andrews, who uh, was uh, famous for uh, racing uh, airplanes like Moonshiner and Formula One and uh, uh, Real Sporty, 
a number of airplanes that he was really experienced in, wanted to fly this airplane, and he wanted to fly it in the Oshkosh 500, so we did that. And uh, in, in 1982, uh, he was a top single-place airplane of all the airplanes in that, in that category. But the next day, we had the opportunity to go out and fly a closed course. This is uh, in class C1AO, which is uh, the lightest class that you can set a record in um, for air airplanes. It was designed for ultralights. It me meant that the airplane had to take off with fuel and pilot in way under 300 kilos. That's uh, under 660 pounds. Uh, so the 410 pound airplane with, a, with just a little less than 10 gallons of fuel in the pilot, um, it flew flat out uh, in a triangular course. We had to conserve fuel, but you can see the, the speed was pretty uh, impressive. It uh, did 100 kilometers at 185 miles an hour. And, and keep in mind the pe uh, that uh, Chuck was doing this in an age when we didn't have GPS for navigation. So it was all pilotage, uh, a bare bones airplane. Um, but uh, this record still stands today, and, and we're very proud of it. And it, with an engine without an oil cover running this distance is pretty impressive. Um, it, during that period of time in the 1980s, uh, we, uh, my uh, other design partner in, in uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin, uh, his dad was a, was a, uh, a pattern maker, and uh, uh, we uh, hooked up to uh, come up with a bunch of conversion parts to make VWs uh, viable uh, as uh, an engine conversion system. We called that the Aero, Aero V conversion system, and uh, it put things like uh, the first stator alternator ever to be on an airplane uh, was part of that conversion. Uh, we had been using the Taza injector carburetors uh, back when we flew the Sonray 1. It was the first airplane to fly with a lake injector carb, uh, and uh, eventually the Taza carburetors became very popular. It's a slide-type carburetor really based on the design that was in an uh, early Lerone engine. So, uh, very simple kind of design, but uh, all of these components, uh, one, put a prop hub on a motor, uh, put an, uh, a, an intake system on a motor and a mount system uh, that uh, made it into an aircraft-like engine. And really the, the, the boxer style engine, the, the VW, was really designed as an aircraft engine in the first place and later adapted into the automobile. So it's come full circle. Uh, and uh, we really feel that uh, it worked really well. This is a picture of a little lake injector. Uh, you can see it on the bottom of the uh, of one of our early conversions uh, on the Sonoray 2. And that little thing, it looks like a camera. Uh, it, it, it's very simple. Uh, it had a lot of faults. As you can see, there's a, there's a fuel line uh, that goes to the carburetor, and that actually moved with the slide of the carburetor. So guillotine kind of slides open and it exposes a needle through an orifice that uh, meters fuel into the throat of the carburetor. Um, but that had a little fitting on it that was real susceptible to uh, fatigue and breaking off. And of course, the fuel line separated from the, the carburetor. That wasn't a real good thing. Uh, so many uh, improvements were made. Uh, this is a typical old Aero V uh, installation in uh, our Sonoray 2. Uh, and you can see it's been quite compact. These engines didn't have an electrical system, but we really didn't need an electrical system. Uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the early 70s, we hardly had radios, uh, let alone uh, uh, anything that we needed to power. So uh, these airplanes were dirt, dirt simple, and the real philosophy was this was going to be uh, a Cub-type airplane, just like a J3, but a lot faster, uh, but still land slow and have uh, a light wing loading. So that's the background of what uh, we did with uh, our, our airplanes and led to then 2000 when we finally uh, got Sonar, uh, Sonics going. Uh, the Sonics aircraft was designed primarily for an engine about 80 horsepower. Uh, it was originally flown with uh, an 80 horsepower Jabiru engine, but keeping in mind that we were going to update uh, the design of uh, the VW engine components. And you know what really happened um, in the period of time between uh, the early 80s, you know, remember back in the early 80s, we didn't have PCs. So from the 80s to now, we not only have PCs working everything, 
we have all computer uh, assisted machining, uh, CNC machining, etc. Uh, that now we don't have to worry about working with castings. We can work with solid billets. So this engine uh, design uh, first started with uh, developing a carburetor called the Aero Injector. Uh, we actually designed that carburetor with our experience with uh, the Jabiru engines in the early Sonics. Uh, we had a great deal of trouble with the Bing carburetor. Um, I can openly say I have no love for it whatsoever. Uh, it has, even though it has uh, automatic uh, mixture control, uh, it, that is uh, based on air ambient pressures and cowlings and it can be very difficult to control. And the pilot has no control. Uh, it also had to have carburetor heat and it's a float carburetor so you can't fly it upside down. Uh, so we knew that uh, drawing from our experience in the in the 70s uh, that we could redesign a new uh, carburetor and actually this is a test stand uh, engine for some of the aero conversion parts. You see all the red parts of the parts that we designed and evolved uh, and the aero uh, injector or aero carb uh, hanging on the back bottom of the engine. Uh, Sonary, uh, Sonics uh, uh, two place, uh, you can see this is a VW uh, airplane, you can identify that by the little cheek cowls. This is w the primary airplane that we developed, uh, the new aero conversion uh, system and eventually uh, of course did a new cowling uh, to support that engine too. So probably the, the most unique thing or one of the unique things about the Aero V uh, engine package is that it's a kit. Uh, my philosophy is that, you know, if you can put an airplane together, you certainly can put an engine together. Uh, we had, uh, we spent a lot of time uh, with the philosophy of the engine to uh, make it simple, easy to install, uh, a very clean engine from the front to the back so that it could be cowled very tightly. For instance, in a racer, that's what we want in, in all of our airplanes. We want to keep the frontal area down. So all of that, all of the, the systems on the engine had to be designed so uh, they could be streamlined. Uh, we, why uh, a kit engine is really simple and, and like I said, you can, you, can, you can put it together, et cetera. We went through a, a lot of energy or a lot of work uh, putting together a manual and a system for uh, putting this engine together. We have a, a guide video. Uh, that that takes us through it. You know, I got to admit that uh, we did that video of assembling this whole engine in a weekend uh, with a, a good friend of mine that from from uh, NFL Films, and uh, you know I wasn't even feeling very well that weekend, and we uh, we completely assembled the engine. But we you know we had takes time and time again uh, where we had you know I'll get a, let's get a different different camera angle, et cetera. So we had to disassemble, assemble everything. But the whole engine was assembled in, in two days of filming. So uh, an individual going through it the first time uh, with the aid of the, of the uh, manuals can certainly uh, assemble this engine very uh, easily. Um, so there's, there's an example of the manuals that we have, the video, the aero, uh, carb uh, installation guide, aero V assembly, and actually for the Sonics we have a firewall forward thing, which is Unique to our business, I think probably one of the things that we do really well that that there's only a few, a hand, not even a handful, just a few, you can count them on your two fingers actually, of people that, uh, or businesses that produce engines as well as airframes. So we modified our, our airframe um, uh, for, for this engine, we designed it around this engine, uh, and we designed the engine. So uh, to us it's a, a perfect marriage. So what are the features about it? Well, you can, again, it's um, low frontal area. This engine is uh, based on a VW. The only real uh, authentic uh, uh, VW part is the engine case, and that's modified uh, to uh, carry the bigger bore cylinders, uh, and it has some buttressing welded on and some special machining done to it to uh, accept our uh, our proprietary crankshaft and uh, hub assembly. And that's a counterweighted crankshaft. Uh, this is a crankshaft that really is designed to turn in the neighborhood of 7,000 RPM in racing. We, we're only turning about uh, 35 to 3,600 RPM. Sometimes, you know, when I get crazy uh, uh, in aerobatics, I'll look at 4,000 RPM on the propeller. But uh, in racing, we turn 4,400, so this is not a big deal. 
Um, we use a shrink fit prop hub, uh, and the crankshaft knows, and actually the whole crankshaft is our own crankshaft. It's not uh, anybody's aftermarket crank. Uh, it's made for us uh, to our specifications so that we can fit our, uh, our 4140 prop hub to it. Uh, and use the standard bearings in the, in the, that are VW so that, you know, any time that we might go away, uh, the basic parts for this engine are, are readily available in the aftermarket. Uh, I'm most proud of, of what happens in the back of this engine. Uh, the, not only the prop hub, but uh, what we're looking at here is the accessory case that, that really uh, does all of the things that, that, that make the engine function. Uh, on the top and the bottom, you see two little black modules. Uh, we're looking at that Y-shaped piece, which is the intake manifold. John, you uh, might two, you might try your mouse as a pointer. Oh well, I can maybe yeah, I can do that. Well, there it is. How's that? Does everybody see that? Yep, I can. I can see it. Okay, there's a module right here. Well, I'm a novice at this, but um, the, there there are two uh, ignition modules here. There are two electronic triggers here. These coils are just strapped on here for illustration. Usually they're mounted on the firewall. And let me explain all of what's going on in this unit. One, we've got standard uh, aircraft type mounting uh, shock rubbers. There's four, two of them are covered up by these coils. But that's the main engine mount uh, to this unit. There is a cover plate here that uh, actually houses the uh, alternator, the stator alternator. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, the, the regulator is here. That is also normally mounted on the firewall. Uh, of course, uh, a SkyTech, uh, it's a high torque uh, starter, lightweight starter uh, that runs our own ring gear. Again, we'll take a look at that uh, in, in the future here. Let me explain these. these this is a magnetron, and we'll, we'll go through that. But uh, this one is firing the two uh, plugs that are on the front of the engine on top. The one on the bottom is firing two plugs on the back of the engine. So we have two separate uh, modules that are actually magnetos that are uh, firing using a wasted spark, uh, and we're running two half VWs. The same thing is true, if I can get my mouse back here, of the two electronic ignitions, which uh, they are as a sensor for a little magnet that turns on the center line of the crankshaft. And that runs the two coils, that um, one coil fires the front uh, two plugs, and one fires the back two plugs. So we have uh, four ignition modules on this engine, all of which are run by the crankshaft assembly. There's no uh, moving parts uh, other than the crankshaft assembly. And as everybody knows, if the crankshaft breaks, you're screwed. So uh, th this uh, system is very redundant in that any one of these modules can run a half of this motor. And uh, that is, will produce enough power to keep the airplane airborne at full gross weight. So uh, again, that's a, one of the things we're very proud of. Uh, on the bottom is the uh, aero injector carburetor. Why is it there? Because it runs off of gravity. Um, it ha and I'll talk about its features in a little bit. This is that, that what we call the X fitting um, in that obviously houses uh, again, the, the, so it's a CNC machine part. Uh, it's the heart of, uh, of the engine uh, operating systems. This is a simple magnetron. No big secret here. This is a Briggs & Stratton part. It's the thing that lays out in the garage, in the, in the shed, on, a, on your lawn tractor uh, uh, through the winter, and in the spring you, you, know, you turn the crank and the thing starts. Uh, it's a self-contained magneto. It's got a hall sensor in it. It's it's is excited by a three uh, phase magnet. I'm going to show you right here. Um, it has two poles. It, as the as the flywheel rotates past these units, the little hull sensor right here will sense it and it'll fire simultaneously two plugs. Uh, and then of course there's one at a, at 180 degrees. Uh, this unit over here is simply a counterweight. Again, our proprietary uh, ring gear and our uh, stator magnet ring, which is the heart of the alternator. These are the parts for the electronic ignition. Uh, of course, four plugs. Uh, this uh, little unit has got a little tiny magnet on it 
that goes by a sensor uh, on the back plate that excites uh, either one of these uh, uh, sensors and then fires uh, either one of the coils to the proper cylinders. This is a simple thing as timing. Uh, our magnetrons, the two magnetos, are fixed timing. So uh, this one is adjustable by taking that screw right here and loosening it up and uh, adjusting it so that we sync both the secondary and the primary ignition. We know the engine's in proper timing uh, when we don't see any mag drop. Uh, we can go from one ignition to the other. So we have a 12-volt ignition system here, and we have an ignition system that's self-contained that doesn't require any outside electrical source to run. So uh, we've got all the bases covered. The, the neat thing about this electronic ignition is that it doesn't have to turn at any RPM to get a hot spark. So it is our primary way of starting the engine. Um, we can actually turn it off and run on our magnetrons once the engine's running. So that's you know, pretty common for us just to save electrical energy if we want. Our alternator system is really simple. It's an encapsulated, uh, encapsulated stator. Inside of here, uh, it looks like a little radial motor with a bunch of windings on it. Uh, it's a three-phase motor. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a single-phase stator alternator. Uh, and these magnets are north-south. They go around and uh, excite the various poles on the alternator. The uh, Aero-V installation can be very, very uh, clean. This is on, on a Sonics. Uh, we have a baffling system that uh, we developed uh, for that airplane, which is really adaptable to a whole bunch of others. But there's a bunch of other little plates on here that, that we can look at. That This is a normal VW case. Uh, it, again, it's been modified to fit our prop hub, uh, our breather, our billeted intake manifold, elbows, uh, oil fill, uh, and block off plates. This is an oil cooler bypass plate uh, with an oil pressure uh, uh, sender on it. The oil temperature is sent off the bottom of the engine. So again, it's a pretty straightforward, and we like to keep it simple. And that's what this, this uh, AeroV installation uh, manuals about. It's about setting up the baffles, the collings, and it's specific to Sonics, but certainly adaptable to everything else that's uh, uh, on the uh, AeroV itself. Uh, it's a baffle kit, all laser cut parts, so it's a simple, uh, a few little folds here and there, and uh, some rivets and fitting, etc. Um, I'm really uh, happy with uh, the development of what we call the aero injector and the aero card. Aero card is a little bit bigger version. The first version of this we call this an aero injector because it's a it's a pull type carburetor. It uh, uses a cable system here uh, to pull a slide. And it opens it up, but this thing has some unique features that uh, the earlier carbs like the Posit or the Lake or even even the Bing carburetor. You know they don't have a mount for any of the cables that go into them, the mixture control, etc. This carburetor, and, and understand that uh, these carburetors don't have floats, so they have, you have to have a manual shutoff. And in the old days, when we had uh, uh, these injector-type carburetors without a float in them or any way to shut off the fuel, we would have to shut off the main fuel valve in our airplanes. Uh, and in the sonary, actually, uh, we, we had a, a, a regular starting procedure uh, where we would turn the, turn the fuel on, you know, let the fuel get into the carburetor, turn the fuel off, prop the airplane. Uh, once it's started, turn the main fuel valve on. Well, this has a built-in fuel shutoff and a mixture control. It's actually a big needle valve. And uh, what it does is what we used to do in the old days is that once we got to altitude, uh, if we found that we had needed to link the engine, everybody thinks this is crazy, but we used to turn the fuel valve down. Uh, we would regulate the fuel flow to the carburetor, but you know when you think about it, that's what a mixture control does on any other carburetor that you have. So it, it wasn't that unusual, but we thought it was necessary uh, to build uh, that mixture control into the engine, uh, into the carburetor. We have cockpit adjustable mixture control. You can see here the slide uh, and the tapered needle that's pulling out of the orifice. So the fuel comes in here, is regulated uh, by the mixture control as far as the maximum amount of fuel. The fuel travels down uh, an orifice and out into uh, the throat of the carburetor, which is proportional to uh, the opening on the carburetor. Um, 
this needle then is adjustable back and forth in the slide uh, in an infinite adjustment to uh, get that, that harmony between the amount of air and fuel going through the car. Uh, there's a number of accessories because we made these carbs in, uh, and uh, injectors, and, and we call them injectors. It's a, it's a throttle body, but different than a throttle body from a fuel injection system in that it's actually metering fuel at the same place, but different than a carburetor because it doesn't have um, a classic venturi. One of the reasons it doesn't ice. So we don't have carburetor heat. We don't have that extra complication of all that piping and all that nonsense that uh, you know I've I've been avoided uh, for over 35 years, so uh, it's it's a, a a really nice feature. But a simple air filter and adapters that make these uh, injectors about the same size as a marble shoveler uh, carburetor for mounting on, uh, on Continental and Lycoming engines, also. So uh, it's been very popular that way. Uh, here's the very basic way it works, uh, as I've explained that. That uh, again, we have a tapered needle, a slide, a cable assembly, and a mixture control. And by the way, this is one of our throttle quieters that's uh, built to work with uh, this uh, uh, unit. And we have a couple of them. Uh, Charlie has uh, a, a, a nose dragger airplane uh, that's set up in, a, in the sport trainer configuration. So he's using a throttle assembly similar to this in the middle of the cockpit. This is the one that's classic, you know. Us fighter jocks uh, have this one on the left side of the cockpit, so you know that's a more manly throttle, but that's the way it goes. Um, here, and again, uh, when I talk about the sport trainer, that's a, a unit, that's an airplane that's configured with the controls in the middle, so it can be used uh, for basic orientation flying. So along with that, um, Aero V, we've uh, developed a lot of uh, accessories over the years, and one of the more exciting things that come along. Uh, with all new technology is our nickel cell cylinders. Uh, the technology that's being used in, in literally in all the motorcycles today and most uh, automobiles, um, these are aluminum cylinders. They save about 10 pounds of weight on the engine. So the fully dressed Aero V engine weighs about 152 pounds. Uh, it's a neat setup and uh, you know, it's a, the other, the really neat thing about uh, having a VW based air, uh, engine with all these aftermarket uh, parts available to it. A, a complete set of these Nicosils around 500 some dollars. I mean, when you compare that to what you would pay for one piston or one cylinder for a Continental or Lycoming or Rotax for that matter, uh, it's pretty substantial. Uh, we've developed our own exhaust systems as a simple two in the one exhaust. Uh, system that works for the Sonics and, and many guys have uh, adapted this to many other airplane applications. Uh, an oil separator uh, is a nice unit to have. Uh, what this does is it, it, it brings the breathing air into a tank with a standpipe. Uh, it has another standpipe that allows the breathing air to go overboard and a drain here that now is connected to the bottom of the engine that allows that collected oil to return to the engine. So we don't lose a lot of oil overboard. It keeps the belly of the airplane clean. It's handy in aerobatics. And uh, this is a sport acro. And one of my favorite things is uh, making smoke. And Charlie alluded to that picture in the sport aviation earlier. But uh, this is a typical smoke system. It, uh, it, it's comprised of a tank, um, a solenoid, a filter, and a of, and a pump, and a, a switch on the on the uh, on the uh, instrument panel or stick that uh, turns the pump on, and and uh, the solenoid opens up at the same time and allows us to pump oil, uh, Corvus oil or transmission fluid, whatever. You can read that article in Sport Aviation, but uh, it's a hell of a lot of fun to smoke uh, and uh, and do uh, aerobatics with smoke because we can, you know, we can see where we've been and uh, line up. So to, if, designed to fit on the Sonics, uh, uh, but we have other configurations coming that will be adaptable to other airplanes. John, how much, John, how much weight does the smoke system add? No, oh, well, it's, it carries about a gallon and a half, so that's, you know, uh, that's about uh, 10 pounds of, of smoke oil, and uh, the actual tank only weighs a couple of pounds, so uh, it, it's very, very small amount of weight for, for the fun factor. Um, Sonics, uh, YX, uh, Xenos, uh, all airplanes that are uh, designed around the Aero V. 
And this is something uh, we introduced, uh, we showed it at, um, at uh, Oshkosh this year uh, at Air Venture. Uh, we have been flying it uh, steadily in our YX airplane. Um, we've learned a lot about turbos. It's a, an extremely simple system. It uh, doesn't require any electronic uh, uh, fuel injection because we're using an aero injector. Uh, it has, uh, because the, the turbo is mounted low in the Sonics configuration, and by the way, this is configured to fit in the tail dragger version, uh, the, the turbo will be uh, a little, in a little different place, uh, almost in the same place, but for the tri-gear airplane, it has to avoid the nose strut. Um, we have uh, a scavenge system that brings the oil back into the engine, and, and getting that balanced has been uh, an interesting challenge, but uh, we've, we've conquered that. And uh, it, it, this is not a normalized engine. We're just using a mild boost of about four pounds to uh, uh, up our horsepower in the neighborhood of 100 horsepower. So uh, we're very excited about uh, this configuration. It's Drew Waterworth, and you can see me waiting down a tail. It's what I do these days, I just wait things down. And uh, uh, we're uh, doing some test running here with the initial runs, but uh, uh, that, that turbulent installation is being refined. And, uh, you know, keep an eye on it for it uh, because uh, we think it's a, a simple way to get 100 horsepower and, uh, uh, and not uh, really strain the engine. Again, these engines are, are uh, overbuilt for what we're using them for. And uh, we have found, it, contrary to a lot of speculation, uh, not only EGTs being very, very uh, even because of the pressurized system, but uh, our cylinder head temperatures are in here very, very controllable. Uh, so with the right prop uh, combination, either fixed pitch or adjustable, uh, we expect that this to be a really neat thing. And this is a simple bolt-on deal. If you had an Aero-V, for instance, in a Sonics, uh, you know, you just take the manifold off in the exhaust system and bolt this thing on and change the oil pump and you're ready to go. So it's a pretty straightforward uh, uh, configuration. It adds a little weight. Um, with uh, the uh, Nicosil cylinders on this engine and the full turbo unit, all of this stuff weighs 185 pounds. It's still well below our 200-pound uh, firewall forward unit. Certainly. Uh, Go ahead, John. Uh, John uh, Dudley had asked earlier, uh, had, had emailed me um, about what about the reduced sound benefit? I think you've commented benefit. to me that it's a lot quieter, right? It's a lot quieter, um, you know, damn, uh, because, uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, we really like the sounds of the engines. You know, a sport airplane is supposed to be a lot of fun, so, you know, people are supposed to know you're around. And, uh, you know, we certainly, even with our, with our straight aero bees, we make a lot, you know, about half the, the noise that a, that a Cirrus makes, you know, one of the noisiest airplanes on the airport. But um, this, the, the turbo definitely acts as a muffler and, uh, and uh, quiets the exhaust quite a bit. Now you start to hear prop noise a lot more. And when we're really running laps uh, with this above the airport, it sounds something like an extra 300 fly. So uh, again, that's the turbo uh, uh, installation and very, very uh, clean and simple uh, installation. Uh, you can see we're running props uh, uh, here that are uh, up to 52 inches pitch. And keep in mind that, that we turn a lot higher RPMs than we would on a Jabiru 6 or something. But uh, we're seeing really nice performance figures. Uh, uh, we're, we're doing triangular courses uh, at 160 miles an hour. Uh, for an Aero V powered Sonics, that's pretty damn fast. Um, and uh, uh, rates of climb solo uh, well over 1,500 feet a minute. So uh, it's, it's really a performer uh, and, and still uh, looking at an engine that's going to be in the economy class. John, can I get a couple of questions in here on the uh, turbo? Sure, I'm, I'm almost done. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, any idea on a release date? Um, it'll be released when it's released. Um, you know, like all of the things uh, that we do, you know, the Sonics is primarily uh, not only a, a kit manufacturer and engine manufacturer, we are really a development company. Uh, and that's my job. Uh, in R&D, uh, we, we build these projects and uh, we fully test them. And uh, the turbos, uh, uh, one of these things that uh, 
running it now, uh, getting it into production uh, with uh, exhaust systems and intake systems. We're, we're, we're try trying a few uh, little different installations. We do have to work out the installation for the Tri-Gear Sonics, which will you know, make it easier to fit in some other configurations, other airplanes. So, uh, you know, we can't say when the release date is. It obviously, like all things, being a capitalist that I am, uh, it's in our, and it's in our uh, best interest to get some things to the market uh, in a reasonable amount of time, uh, considering the investment that we have in, in each project that we're doing. So uh, we're, we're trying to get it to the market, and, 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 but you know what? We have a lot of fun in the meantime. And what about the potential of the turbo for the 1X? That's what Walt wants to know. Uh, it's possible. And, uh, again, that's another thing down the road. And, and Walt, uh, we're, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, this is a retrofittable item. Uh, so you could be flying your 1X and then, and then convert it over to turbo if that comes available. The 1X is going to perform pretty damn good with uh, just a straight 2180 uh, uh, aero beam. Don't get greedy. And any projected fuel burns on the turbo? Um, yeah, it, it, it's, you know, at, at about 100 horsepower, it's going to be pulling just about what a 100 horsepower engine does. So you're going to be, you're going to be looking at uh, fuel burns anywhere from 5 to 6 gallons an hour. Okay, and uh, will the turbo increase the gross weight capability on the Sonics aircraft? Why would it? Power loading. Oh, okay. Power loading, uh, no, because the, the remember the Aero V uh, is uh, and the you know it, it may move up into the class that the the uh, the uh, 120 horsepower Jabru is, um, but you know significantly increasing the the uh, gross weight isn't the thing with, that we're looking at. Um, we're looking at increasing the performance, particularly for for guys those guys that live out in Denver, etc. Now they can have a uh, a turbocharged engine that's uh, going to give them more horsepower to take off and uh, and more climb, uh, and uh, you know that'll that'll make up for some deficiencies. Actually, at altitude, uh, this this thing will really compete uh, very favorably. I mean, at higher altitudes, compete very favorably with a six-cylinder Jabru. And I'll wrap up the the turbo questions for right now with: Do you have any idea what the price of a turbo would be? Uh, the the Aero V engine uh, is pretty reasonable, and you can check our website. But um, you know, it's it uh, it won't add too much money to the uh, to to the actual project. So uh, it's still uh, highly competitive with anything else out there. Uh, and I and I mean a lot less expensive to say a Jabru twenty two hundred. Does that answer your question? Well, I, I'm going to hold off until you finish up now. <laughs> okay, I'm done. All right, I'm done. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm... Oh, you are done. Yeah, I'm done. Look at this. I'm okay, we'll go back to full screen mode so it looks nice. Well, all right. How's that? Perfect. Okay. Yeah, I, I should have put my face up or maybe uh, my friend Tony Spicer's face right here. Uh, I, I said I wanted it to look nice. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, Steve would like to install the AeroCarb on a Jabiru 3300A. Uh, any uh, any thoughts on that? That's what it was designed for. That's the whole genesis of the carburetor was to put on a 3300 Jabiru. All of our 3300s basically uh, uh, use that. You can throw away all that all that uh, complicated uh, intake system, uh, balancing systems, etc. That go on uh, on a normal uh, Jabiru six cylinder. Uh, we've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours on uh, Jabiru 6s with, uh, with their, uh, the aero injectors on them. The new aero injector, too, is a lot smaller than the aero carb, so uh, it makes the installation even easier. I recommend uh, using one of our throttle quadrants uh, with the pull system. Uh, it, that's probably the only drawback to uh, an injector carburetor like this is that uh, there is tr a tremendous amount of suction uh, on the plate of the carburetor uh, when it's closed, so uh, we want we want to be able to o open it uh, directly with a pull system instead of a push system. Most push-pull cable throttles 
like your veneer throttles and so are pretty wimpy in their ability to push because the housings usually stretch if they re, re, um, have any resistance. So they're not effective pushing uh, 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 mechanical uh, devices. They're better for pulling. So uh, we, we developed our own pull system with our, with our throttle primer. Okay, uh, and for those of you that are keeping score, we have about 241 people on the webinar tonight. Uh, so I thank you for attending. Uh, Peter has a question, uh, a good one. Is there an Aero V 2.0? And if there is, uh, what are the differences with 2.1? And are they all, both engines, still 80 horsepower? Both engines are the same. The 2.0 uh, had a, a standard uh, VW aftermarket uh, stroke crank. The 2.1 has our own crank in it, which has a bigger nose on it. Uh, and a different uh, a different uh, machine prop hub for it. Um, there's nothing wrong with the 2.0, but we we've had such a volume of engines that we were now able to go to a crank manufacturer and get our cranks made to our specs, uh, which we're always improving. And you know, it's Charlie. We're we're all always looking at trying to improve. This is, you know, there's never anything in particular engines that's perfect. Um, so you know, I'm uh, you know I've, you know the deal about you know got to shoot the artist. Well, that's somebody's going to have to shoot me because uh, you know I keep looking at other ways to to try and either simplify it or or make them a little bit better and more serviceable. Uh, you know, I'm I'm working on these airplanes every day. And my hands are full of oil, and you know I just don't like working with a lot of oil and things. So um, it's it you know it, we're always looking a way to uh, make it even better. So the 2.1 really addresses a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, just a, a nice opportunity uh, to have our own crankshaft. Okay, Guy would like to know if the aero carbon or aero injector will run on a Continental 65, 75, or 85, etc. Absolutely. Um, we have different size carburetors, uh, a little 32 millimeter carburetor, same carb that we use on on our, uh, our carb, and, 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 I, and I use that term generically when I talk about aero injector or aero carb. Uh, the aero injector is a new model, actually. Aero car, uh, the aero carb is being uh, phased out because it is a, a bigger unit. It's, it's about nine ounces heavier, and uh, the aero injector is a more refined design. Uh, so that yes, they can. There's adapters for it. Just uh, visit our website. You'll see the adapters. You can bolt it right up to a Continental. Now, again, in a home-built situation, this is not a certified carburetor. Okay, and Robert would like to know what type of paint is best for painting the crankcase. Uh, really simple. Um, it, um, forever, I have been just uh, cleaning up the crankcases, and I spray them with cry Krylon uh, barbecue black. Simple as that. Works really well. I know there's a lot of people that mix paint with gasoline and do all kinds of weird stuff, but. Uh, you know, if you just clean up the case well and, and spray it, it'll work really well. And I believe it was satin black that I used yeah, on ours. Yeah, satin black. Yeah, not I mean, barbecue you can, black. You can make it, uh, you know, pathetic pink if you want to, but um, it, it, it's, it, the black works really well. That yeah, looks pretty handsome engine there on the screen, I think. Very good. Uh, Mark would like to know if there's been any experience with icing using the aero, aero injector under certain conditions. Under no conditions has there been any experience of ice. Uh, in 30 years of documentation of flying these types of carburetors, there's never been one documented case of icing. It just doesn't happen. This has a straight through, uh, it's not a venturi, it's a straight, straight through throttle opening. Uh, and the the slide uh, is not conducive to ice like a butterfly, uh, so we're not necking down uh, the intake. The mixture of the fuel and air is actually done in the manifold beyond the the injector, so uh, that eliminates that that kind of, uh, of situation. Okay, and Robin would like to know what instrumentation do you recommend for an Aero V? Oh. The most expensive unit you can possibly buy, um, probably you know, uh, you know, you can look anywhere and, and see what kind of stuff. What what we use, um, uh, you know, we use uh, some MGL instruments. They're really simple. I like the little smart singles because they're really inexpensive for what they do. 
But basically all we want to do is we want to monitor, monitor our RPM, we want oil pressure temperature, and uh, cylinder head temperature. Uh, EGT is nice. It's not totally necessary. Uh, but, you know, a, a smart single that uh, does, uh, does all the engine uh, monitoring, uh, and you can, let, again, see it on our website, uh, it's an electronic device that uh, does all of that stuff and logs it and, and uh, keeps track of it pretty well. So we, can, we usually monitor uh, two cylinder head temps, the two aft cylinders, and two EGPs, the two aft uh, exhaust pipes. And by the way, there's just an excellent article on EGPs and CHTs in the last sport aviation, not this current month, but the month before last. And that really explains a lot about engine uh, monitoring. And guys get crazy about, you know, oh, my, my one cylinder is uh, 25 degrees out from another one. And, you know, it's just, it's all to do for me to get on the web and just shake things up. But, um, you know, that's not really important. It's, you know, you get, 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 as long as your maximum cylinder head temps don't get above 400 degrees, and normally we operate uh, in the 350 degrees uh, temperature range or so. Uh, EGTs, if it, it is totally dependent on uh, placement of the probes, and those those probes uh, uh, usually read about 1300 to 1350, and of course we we adjust the mixture as we go uh, uh, to altitude. So uh, that's just something that's that's the way it is. So I was kidding about the most expensive. Engine. You don't need a lot of expensive instruments. The whole idea of Sonics and Aero-V is to keep flying at a reasonable cost. Um, now it it isn't it isn't for anything. It's not cheap to build an airplane by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, if you th if you think flying is cheap, uh, uh, you, you are delusionary. But um, it is about keeping it within reason. Okay, and I believe the article you were referring to, John, was the October issue by Mike Bush. Uh, it might have been. Okay, and uh, Dana has a question. Are there any special tools required to build the Aero-V? Um, other than, uh, no, actually, uh, what kind of tools do you need? You need a torque wrench. Uh, you need a, a, you know, an inexpensive set of SAE uh, wrenches and metric wrenches, the same stuff you're going to build your airplane with. So uh, nothing really, really uh, uh, at all that's... Uh, uh, necessary. Uh, you can, you know, if you don't have an impact wrench or a, uh, uh, an air compressor, etc., you can get the can't crank uh, pre-assembled with the prop hub. So that's an option. That's not very expensive. Okay, and uh, let's see. You need to be play nice here, but do you uh, firewall forward kit for a Zenith Stoll CH750? Uh, you mean what the price? No, have you has anybody run it on a CH750 that you're aware of the Aero V? Um, I don't know, but you can check our website because it has the airplanes that we've had them on. And and I apologize for that, but you know my nose is in R&D all the time. I'm not looking at the website. And frankly, I don't even know what a CH whatever that is is. It is a Zenith. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, it's a Zenith, but I don't know which model that is. I'm sure a lot of people don't know which what a YX is, too. So. Okay, Bill would like to know if there's any special techniques required to keep this engine cool when mounted in the Sonics. Special techniques? Uh, build it uh, to the, uh, you know, to our firewall forward installation. Um, that's pretty pretty straightforward. I know there's always some of these side remarks on the, on the uh, website about uh, oh those those engines up in Wisconsin they run cool well they you know what they do uh, and we run them in uh, in in hot temperatures everybody knows that we we uh, we, we run these airplanes uh, in the 80s and 90 degrees thing you know and you know who the hell wants to go out and fly when it's 110 degrees out and who wants to go out and fly when it's below 20 degrees I don't I don't. But uh, keeping it cool is, is just a simple matter of following the, the, the and paying attention to uh, not only the, the, the manuals and the, the, the buildup of the engine, but to the buildup of uh, the cooling baffles, et cetera, on the engine. Those are so defined uh, in our firewall forward uh, manuals. 
Okay, and Guy would like to know if the uh, turbo setup would be able to be retrofitted to Sonari 2. Um, probably if you want to give up the front cockpit and have a really nice cabin heater. But other than that, it's, it, it's going to be pretty tough to fit it in there. Uh, it can be done, um, but our standard configuration wouldn't fit. Okay, what about E10 MoGas? Sonary 2 doesn't need a turbo. Sonary 2 is great with a 20, 2180. Come on. All right, go ahead. Okay, what about E10 MoGas? What about it? What what fuel do you recommend for the Aero V, and what about ethanol? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell it like I tell it every, everybody that's ever been to one of my forums. Uh, I like to use 100 low lead. Um, and the simple thing is, if you can't afford to put four gallons an hour of, of 100 low lead in your airplane, you can't afford to fly. Uh, going out and buying a, a auto gas that, that, you know, it may be 10% ethanol, maybe, you know, who knows what's in it these days. There's so many different blends for so many different areas of the country. We recommend that you lower the compression ratio. Well, that's not, you know, that's just, uh, you, you lose a few horsepower by doing that. Uh, so, uh, you know, at, I, I prefer, as long as it's available, to use 100 low leg. You can always lower the compression ratio late, uh, lower. Um, but, uh, you know, most of the airports you go to will have 100 low leg. Very few of them will have auto fuel. I am not an auto fuel fan. Okay. Uh, what kind of TVO can I expect from my uh, Aero V based engine? Uh, we have some AeroVs out there that uh, are approaching 1,000 hours or more. Uh, we don't look at TBOs on experimental airplanes. Uh, the average home builder literally flies about 25 to 26 hours a year. So, you know, these engines are going to rust out before they wear out. Uh, and with proper maintenance and everything, uh, you, know, we can, you can get a lot of time on them. And, you know, you really have to work to get 1,000 hours on an airplane. I mean, you have to be retired and be able to fly every day and uh, to get a thousand hours in, in five or six years. So a, a TVO is not a big, big uh, measuring device for us. Okay, Rick would like to know if there's an Aero V 2.2 in the works. Uh, an Aero V 2.2. Uh, the, the only the designation would be if we. Uh, come up with some major mod to the engine, which, you know, that's not in the, 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 the understand that the basic block of this engine, the stuff that's all black and silver on this uh, picture, um, is, it, it is the same basic configuration we've been flying for 25 years. Um, and so the, it, all, all the other stuff is just refinement. I, we might even call the turbo 2.2. Who knows? But so I won't say no, but it doesn't mean that we're going to look at any big major change. Okay, over and out. No. Nope. Okay. Uh, well, as you were talking, I was just going to chime in because uh, your son Jeremy uh, mentioned that uh, your Aero uh, V website, which I'm bringing up right now. Uh, for those of you that are looking at installations other than on a Sonics, uh, a helpful resource is uh, from the aeroconversions.com website. On the right side of the page here, there's this customers, uh, Aero V installations, and I'm just going to scroll down here. Obviously, it's in all the Sonics aircraft, but uh, you see somebody had it on a three-quarter scale Waco, uh, so a just aircraft, uh, the Flitzer, which is I'm up on page right, uh, should be showing my screen right now. Uh, hopefully everyone's seeing that. Sonary 2 is... Yep. Yeah. Uh, a Jodel. A uh, plane I cannot pronounce. Um, a Rans S6. That's a mystery ship. A Sky Ranger, Sonari, and a motor glider. So quite a, a variety of aircraft. I, I guess I'd ask you, John, is there any... I mean, obviously the Sonics is a relatively sleek aircraft. Is there any aircraft that you'd not recommend it for? Cessna 172, probably. That was very helpful. Very helpful. Yes. 
Um, it, you know, any place that uh, in, in, uh, in any airplane that uh, can fly on on this kind of horsepower um, and uh, you know, in the in the class that the Jabiru's etc. are in, uh, you know, it'd be very suitable. So, uh, you know, it, this engine is, um, and, and the only engines we can really compare it to on the on the market. Uh, well, you know, there's several competitors building VW-based engines, um, and I always say, well, just look at them. Uh, and uh, see how the systems are integrated. Uh, it's it, it, it's always a, a, a nice a, a nice flattering things to have uh, our innovations copied, which you know basically they have been. So, uh, but you know it seems like they got the words but not the music. Uh, and putting a putting an engine package together to make it work uh, and, uh, and not only function but look good is 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 something that we're very proud of. Okay, Mike has a, a good question. If aero conversions went away, would I still be able to service my engine? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, uh, the the aftermarket parts, uh, our our heads are standard uh, uh, 401 uh, high performance uh, racing heads, uh, and c cylinders and pistons are standard rings, uh, all the bearings, etc. So yes, you would be able to service uh, uh, service your engine. Um, uh, from that point, and hopefully that that doesn't happen in the near future. But you know we've considered that, and that's one of the one of the big advantages of building your own engine too. Uh, is that you know a lot of guys have oh, you know our our big, biggest nightmare are second owners uh, because uh, you know they haven't had uh, familiarity with engines. They just want to buy an airplane and make it work. And uh, most home builds are not Cessna 172s. Uh, there isn't you know there the support out there at the local airport isn't there. So, you know, having a knowledge of, of building the engine, putting it together, knowing what's inside of it, being able to service it, not being afraid to take it apart and fix it if you had to, uh, that's that's all a big plus for, for you assembling the engine, besides the, the obvious monetary savings in doing that. Um, you know, we're at Sonics and we are not interested in building engines. Uh, we're, we're, we're interested in supplying engine kits that can go together and work. Okay, Mark would uh, know what the would like to know what the typical break-in time for an Aero V is. Uh, typical time is tuning the carburetor and going and flying it. Um, the engines uh, like to be run uh, at at higher RPM settings initially. Uh, so that we can set the rings, etc. So uh, we don't have a specific break-in period. You will find that uh, you know cylinder head temperatures, etc., will settle down uh, pretty rapidly uh, once they're run hard. The worst thing that could happen uh, is a guy that fiddles around with his engine and running it a lot on the ground, doing taxi and goofing around it without uh, going and flying it. That's that's a psychological thing. It's not it's not part of a good engine uh, run-in. Regimen, so uh, we want to have the engine uh, uh, run hard uh, initially, just like we would with a Continental uh, uh, 65 or 85 or whatever. Just run the hell out of it, and uh, that really does the, the best job of breaking in the rings, etc. Okay, and Aaron would like to know what kind of um, uh, crews you would see in a YX on a cross country and. You know, kind of what power setting are you looking at? Um, remember we, that we cruise fairly high, so uh, we like you know our, our comfortable cruise. These these engines are in their power curve at about uh, 3,400 rpm. So if we uh, cruise at uh, 3,400 rpm, you're gonna you're gonna look at a normal uh, cruising 2,500 foot cruise. You're gonna see 130 miles an hour. So so uh, you know at the higher altitudes, you'll be able to run full throttle. So. Uh, you know, you can you can run it out. You know, most guys will you know run a baby engines, and uh, you know it's just not in our it's just not in the way that we operate these engines. Just keep in mind that the 35, 3600 RPM is like 65 miles an hour in a car. Okay. Okay, and uh, Phil has a comment. He says there's a fair amount of chatter um, regarding needle selection for the aero carb. Is it difficult to select the correct needle, or is it just guys messing with a good thing? 
You got it. Um, it's guys messing with it. No, it's not. Of course, every configuration is different. Now, you know, if he's talking about, you know, Sonics, um, and, uh, you know, depending on where you are in the country, is sometimes that may have, or what temperature that you're trying to start it. But uh, we have we have a selection of needles, and they, they go from a 1 up to a 5. Uh, and the mid-range needles are, are, are that. Uh, it's very easy to select it pretty easily. Uh, with your initial uh, static runs, uh, you know, you should be looking at uh, initially an engine, a tight engine, you're going to idle it at, uh, at 900 to 1,000 RPMs. Again, the cam on this engine has a lot of overlap, so it's not going to sit there and idle at four or 500 RPMs, so just forget that. You're not going to run the engine in a mid-range of, you know, 2,000 to 2,500. You just don't fly there. Uh, so what it runs like then is as long as it transitions that period, it's pretty easy to find the needle that'll give you a, a nice nice idle uh, and and go right up to uh, 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 full throttle. And I think uh, Charlie can attest to the fact that we just put a carburetor on his engine and fired it up and didn't even touch it. That is uh, correct. So, correct. Yeah. So uh, it, it's you know usually a number two needle in a in a Sonic, so it might be a two two or two point five. Uh, needle, but uh, when you start playing with the configuration of the needle, uh, in other words, filing on it or trying to to uh, uh, profile it uh, so that it runs in all the regimes, that's just nuts. Uh, it's just really hard to do. It's not. It's not at all necessary. Okay, and I uh, just got, went ahead and pulled up on screen the website with the price of the engine, and there's also some other. Um, specs listed so if you're interested in in the detailed specs on the engine it is on the website um, Jerry has a question is the front crank bearing unique to aircraft installations for prop loads is it unique uh, it is it isn't unique it's the, there's two bearings if you look at the crank there's a, a, a small bearing that's just behind the prop hub and there's another one right at the first main journal which is only you know two inches behind it. Uh, that is adequate for uh, any of the gyroscopic loads on these airplanes. We're not, we're not throwing uh, uh, heavy aluminum propellers. Um, we are uh, operating with propellers that weigh between uh, four and about uh, six to seven pounds, uh, including a ground adjustable propeller. So uh, we don't have that much uh, load on, on the engine. The thrust is taken through the back of the engine, through the normal thrust bearing, right through the crankshaft, and you can see that that, that you know that, that crankshaft is very robust. So uh, that's not an issue. Okay, and uh, tell me if I have already asked this one, but what kind of TBO can you expect? We already asked that. And okay. I already answered. okay. Then we will move on to the next one. <laughs> what is your thoughts on reduction drives? Um, Rejection drives are, are fine. Uh, we don't have airplanes that need them. Uh, you know, that's, that's a whole other regime. Now, like the point of, you look at this engine. Let's look at it. There isn't, there isn't a lot of junk on this engine. Um, and there isn't a lot of machinery on it. We have uh, the crankshaft and the camshaft are the two moving parts with the pistons, et cetera. But now we start getting into um, uh, reduction drives, and uh, it's, you know, it's, it's just not uh, in our philosophy. So should I show my your, my screen? Yes. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I okay. thought you were starting to refer to what was on your screen. That's why I thought I'd give it back. Oh, thank you. Um, all right. Well, just look at this engine. <laughs> uh, we don't have a, a reduction drive on it. Uh, there, there's there's a lot of myth in in propellers and engines. Uh, you know. I, and I always laugh because I, you know, the Zeno, uh, the Zenos, uh, our motor glider is it just performs the hell out of everything uh, uh, as far as rate of climb because of the big wings and everything. It it is the biggest airplane, twice the size of a Sonics of our uh, in our fleet. It has the teeny tiniest propeller on it, and uh, and that's for a number of reasons. Designed to low drag when you shut it down, but. It it, uh, it it climbs uh, extremely well and uh, gets off the ground very, very short. Um, so it's, it's a matter of the airframe, you know, uh, uh, reduction drives are for those big 
big uh, draggy airplanes that don't go anywhere. So it's not important for us. Okay. Okay. And uh, what's the maximum prop size that you could run on a 2180? Well, you can run uh, uh, a little over 60 inches, uh, depending on what RPM you're operating and what kind of pitch. Um, you know, if you have a, a, a drag your airplane, uh, you know, as, as there's no reason that this airplane couldn't fly uh, a Piper Cub or, uh, or a Vagabond uh, replica, etc., uh, with a with a 60 inch uh, prop. Um, normally, uh, we're running uh, on Sonics, and in, in, in that goes for even a Jabru 6. We're running a prop diameters of about 56 inches. Uh, when we get up above, uh, when we get uh, you know uh, that that higher range, you know 58 inches in diameter. Or so, and if we're turning up to around 4,000 RPM, uh, then we're getting into the the blades getting sonic. But you know nobody runs them up there anyway. So uh, that's that's just uh, the way it is, and and that's true of a Jabru engine or anything else. Okay, David like, would like to know if the Aero V can be run in a pusher configuration. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I'm proud to say that um, that uh, Rutan's Dick Rutan and Bert Rutan's first airplane were very easy. Uh, flew with my engine and set the record. It was the engine out of my racer, and that was a pusher, pusher configuration. And of course, it flew 17 and a half hours straight. Um, you know the configuration uh, that they had for cooling was 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 questionable, um, but anyways that that airplane had a lot of time on it with my engine, and it you know it's it's just the same uh, the same rules. It's just uh, in the pusher configuration you have to make sure that you have proper cooling and uh, and airflow through a baffle system or whatever. Okay, and uh, Ronaldo would like to know your thoughts on whether he should install a gas collator if he's using the Aero V 2.1 and the Aero Injector. Um, frankly, Charlie, we've gone away from uh, 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 gas collators. Uh, they have always been a pain in the ass. Uh, they uh, are uh, they're harbingers of most of the bad things that can happen with an engine configuration. Uh, they're 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 mounted low. Uh, they're in a if they're in a pressure cowling of any type, they get heated up, and they're a source of, uh, by getting heated, uh, the flow of fuel through them uh, will, will develop vapor, and they get, you get a big bubble of vapor, and uh, eventually that has to be digested. Now, in some cases, a float carburetor will be able to kind of smooth that out, but in an injector, you'll, you'll just get a gulp of, of air going through the, the fuel line, and the engine, will, uh, the engine will miss momentarily. It's one of, probably one of the biggest things we see on, on, on our websites and, and guys uh, complaining about is that all of a sudden their engine has a little uh, hiccup. And, uh, you know, by eliminating the gas collator, we, we, we eliminate 99% of the problem. Uh, the, the carburetors, uh, in it, like, for instance, in the Sonics, uh, it's a straight line downward to the carb uh, or the aero injector from the outlet of the tank, and uh, the uh, the fuel valve system. We use a fuel uh, filter and go directly to the carb. Uh, believe me, if there was any water or contaminants in uh, the fuel line, uh, the engine wouldn't start. Our fuel flows straight through the carburetor, so uh, it, and that can catch up with you in a float carburetor. Uh, and, and why you might want to have a, a, a gas collator there because uh, the float can slowly fill up with water, and uh, you know, and then eventually the engine stops. And an aero carbon won't; it'll just swallow it. Okay. And Walter would like to know if uh, you have to use break-in engine oil, or can we go with the ten W forty right away? Yeah, we've been using ten W forty right away. Um, and you can use straight mineral oil if you want. And I, and I would suggest, uh, as we did with Charlie's engine, a lot of times if you if you have mineral oil available, and that's just a you know cheap uh, non-detergent oil. Uh, initial uh, in your initial buildup of the engine, you're going to have a lot of assembly grease uh, in on the bearings, etc., on the cam. Uh, you know you can run the engine for a short period of time. You know. Uh, and while you're getting your carburetor adjusted, etc., on mineral oil, I would get it warm and then drain it out, 
and replace it with uh, our 2050 uh, our, uh, racing model. Okay, and Guy would like to know if the rear thrust bearing carries the thrust load or the center bearing. It's the rear one. Uh, that's a double-sided, it's a spool-type bearing, so it takes thrust loads in both directions. Incidentally, the prop thrust is way less than you put on it with a clutch, and a push and a clutch pedal down in the car. So uh, propeller thrust is a lot less than that, so we, we, we're not loading that bearing very heavily, nor are we pulling, pulling the crank out of shape with the thrust of the prop. Okay, and uh, Bill's asking a question about the manufacturing of the case, and I know you covered this earlier, but I think some other people missed it as well. Uh, the case is the only VW part on the aircraft, correct, John? Uh, yes, that's correct. There are a few minor parts that are VW, but uh, essentially that's that's the only major uh, VW part. It's the Almag alloy case that's been made forever. And but it is, it is it is modified specifically for the Aero V installation. Yeah, yeah. One of the mods for all the 2180s is there's a web in the back of the engine uh, on this on the. Um, let's see if can I get my arrow right in the area here behind uh, this plate. There's a, a bolstered uh, 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 area that's welded in, uh, and then in the, in the front of the engine, this is machined out to accept our hub. Uh, it's just a bigger diameter for the oil slinger system. Uh, but that's, you know, that, that's basically it. There's a few holes uh, for starter clearance, et cetera, that are put in it, but it's a pretty straightforward case. Okay, and then uh, the air oil separator, um, what are your, what's your primary rationale for using that now with the AeroV? Well, it separate the oil from the air. So, you know, you don't dump oil overboard, you recover it. Now, a lot of guys go, oh, it's all that frothy stuff that comes out. Ooh, yuck. Uh, you know, if you could look inside your engine, that's all it is, guys. <laughs> it's a big malted milk in there. So uh, we're, we're trying to recover that oil. Also, when you roll the airplane upside down, which some of us do, uh, we don't dump all the oil overboard on the breather. Okay, and uh, on the Nicocell cylinders, do they have cooling fins? Yeah, you're looking at a picture of the Nicocell cylinders uh, right there. They're black, but um, these are cylinders right there. Yeah, they look exactly like the cast iron cylinders, except they're made out of aluminum, and they have a, a Nicocell cylinder. That's why the 10-pound difference, and believe me, I didn't believe that they would, they would be that much lighter, but they are. And so that, that brings the engine weight down to 152 pounds. Pretty, pretty light for an aero, a full-featured VW-based uh, engine, meaning that it has complete dual ignition, alternator, starter, everything on it. It's pretty light. Okay, Tim would like to know if you've ever heard of any applications of the aero in any sort of tailwind, you know, Whitman tailwinds. Um, I haven't. Um, the the original there's you know a lot of the tailwinds were flying around with 65 continentals. Uh, the tailwind's pretty clean, and I, I do have a lot of experience in tailwinds, uh, so or a fair amount of experience in tailwinds. And uh, you know I don't I don't doubt for a minute that if an airframe was kept really light that it would be that would be sufficient power for that. This is just like I said, a vagabond. You know this engine's so much better than a than a Lycoming 65 that powered a vagabond. It's pathetic. Um, and you know, it's full featured with electric start and everything. It'd be an awesome uh, engine for an airplane like that. Okay, and on the turbo, are you using a, a higher compression ratio, or is it a, a stock Aero V? No, it's a stock Aero V. It's eight to one compression ratio. We don't want to run the compression ratio up high on a turbo engine. It, the turbo does that. Okay. Uh, well, John, I know you're on vacation, and we've already run about 10 minutes over. So well, I want to thank you for spending your evening with us. Uh, I still have a whole bunch of questions. If they have additional questions about the Aero V, what's the, what's the best source of information after the, the presentation? 
uh, address all those questions to Jeremy. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Jeremy. Um, well, well, there's Carrie and there's you know everybody on his hands. I mean, you you can email him, but really, um, you know, the the best source is going to the website and uh, you know in in joining one of the lists. Uh, the Aero Talk deal. I mean, that that's a great source of misinformation. Uh, but you know, you got to sort through all that that stuff, and uh, you know, it's it's a it's a good thing to come to the source. I will uh, put a plug in uh, on my experience with the Aero V. Um, I can tell you that it is the the support, both in the video, and the written manual is excellent. Um, you know, this is something that I'd never done anything like this before, and uh, with minor assistance from the guys over at Sonics, I was able to accomplish the uh, assembly of the engine, and so far so good. Done the first test run, and everything seems to be working just fine. It is a pretty basic, simple engine when you have it. I mean, it sounds intimidating, but it's, you know, it's a really basic engine when it gets right down to it, and their, their materials are excellent. So if you know if you have anybody around that is uh, uh, at, at all experienced in engines, they could help you get through any parts that that you would struggle with. So with that, I want to thank you, John, for signing on tonight. Uh, and the websites again are SonicsAircraft.com. Correct. Oh yeah, uh, I'm sorry, I was sleeping. You're not done yet. <laughs> okay. SonicsAircraft.com and AeroConversions.com, is that correct? Uh, yes, I think it is. Okay. If not, check the web. There's links from our SonicsAircraft.com to uh, right to Aero Conversions. And, and, you know, things like the turbo and, and updates and, uh, you know, keep an eye on our, our, uh, our uh, Hornet's Nest web website because that's, you know, that's really the, the venue where we're doing, like, the turbo conversion, the jet, the electric airplane, and all of the all of the goofy fun stuff that we're doing, all the headache stuff too. But uh, uh, you know, we've got a, we've got a lot of, of, of irons in the fire, and uh, you know that's that makes it exciting. So um, if you guys are out there, you know, thinking about building an airplane or you know building an engine or whatever, get to it because uh, it's uh, it, it's really really fun to have uh, some passion in your life and. Uh, and at the same time. And I will also add that we've done a number of hints for home builder EA videos um, that directly relate to VW engines, so you might want to check those out, and that's at eaa.org slash video. So with that, thank you, John. Uh, thank Betty for me, and uh, say hi to Tony. And with that, I want to thank everybody else for signing on tonight. I'm going to wrap this up and call it an evening. Have a great night. Okay. Bottoms up. Is it done? No, how long will it be before your phone rings? It's...